Well, over um, in the States with President Biden and here with our government policies, over the last year, both of them have gone with the tagline, Build Back Better. And today, in this last of our, our reboot ser sermons, really, as we're sort of thinking about this time of, of rebooting after the pandemic, I want us to, as it were, think about build back better, uh, rebuild, as I've called it, but to think about it from a Christian perspective. Now, if you were to ask Boris or Joe Biden to sort of unpack their Build Back Better campaign a little bit, probably what they would do, they'd answer in terms of growth for you. You know, they'd talk about economic growth or... or, or um, infrastructure growth or education growth or employment growth or innovation growth or all sorts of different types of growth is how they'd sort of tell you about it. But it'd be growth, wouldn't it? Particularly sort of after all the, the restrictions, if you like, of the pandemic. And so too for us, as, as we rebuild as Christians, it is about growth. It is also about growth, but a very different type of growth. I'd love you to have a look at what Paul says at the start of this letter. The Colossians, we've been looking at it the last few weeks. And uh, he speaks of the, the true message of the gospel that has come to these Christians in Colossae. It's come through this guy, Epaphras, preaching to them. And then Paul continues, and you look on the screen at verse 6. And this is what he says. He says, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So for the Christian, Christian rebuilding is all about gospel growth. Gospel growth. And by that, Paul is meaning the number of Christians growing numerically. He's meaning the church getting bigger, the church being built up as more and more people understand God's grace and positively respond to the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And so really the, today, the question that I'd love each one of us to sort of wrestle with in our minds and our hearts is this, how do you and I, how do we relate to gospel growth? How do we relate to gospel growth? Well, firstly, desire it. Desire growth. Uh, last week, Susanna was um, uh, waiting to pick up our two youngest children. Uh, so that's Hope, age seven, and uh, Theo, age five, waiting to pick them up from school. And she was standing there on the pavement waiting for, the, for them to be let out of school. And she got talking to uh, one of the other mums there. And uh, this mum said to Susanna, she said, oh, oh, our daughter, uh, who's in Hope's class, our daughter keeps on telling us that she wants to, to come along to Hope's church, uh, to HTC. And, and Susanna, as she heard this, she was like, of course, of course, please come along. And she's thinking inside, you know, good old Hope evangelizing away. Isn't that wonderful? So she, you know, really wonderful. And, and, and a minute or two later, Hope and Theo come out. And uh, takes them back home. And uh, they're there in the kitchen. Hope and Theo are playing away. And Susanna turns to Hope. And she says to Hope, Hope, Hope have, you, have you been talking to your friend about HTC? And before Hope can get a word in edgeways in reply, Theo suddenly replies rather worriedly. And he goes, I definitely, mummy, I definitely haven't been telling anybody about HTC. I haven't been telling anyone. <laughs> now, now, there's Theo not desiring growth. Um, indeed, Theo, thinking it is positively naughty to tell people about coming to church and, and hearing about Jesus. I mean, I mean, who his parents are, I do not know what they've been teaching him. But how about you? How about you? What, do you desire gospel growth? The Colossians, they certainly desired it. Look at verse six again. It says, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you. So they desired growth as they heard the gospel, they responded positively to the gospel, and then they looked to pass the gospel on to others. And when we look uh, on to verse 13 of chapter one, we're reminded why it's so important to do this. Verse 13, Paul writes, for God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, gospel growth, it is that important. As you look at that verse, it is that crucial. Every single one of us, every person out on the common, every person across South London, everyone, that verse says, needs rescuing, needs redemption, needs forgiveness. Every single person in this world needs to move from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of the sun. So we must desire growth. We must desire for the church to grow as people come to know Jesus. And we must, as you were, desire that personally in our lives. What does it look like personally at the personal level? 
in terms of sharing Jesus with others. But what does it look like too, corporately at the church level? You know, what does it look like for us in terms of church planting strategies and things like that? Actually, that is the, the most effective way across a whole area of a place for actually for people to know about Jesus as we plant individual churches in different localities. So desire growth. Desire it. But then secondly, deliver growth. Deliver growth. But here's the funny thing, because it's really a sort of a paradox what I'm saying here. Because I'm saying deliver growth, but you know, to, to build back better in Christian terms, actually, to do that, we should desire other things more than we desire growth. So I've just said first point, desire growth. But actually, to deliver that, we need, paradoxically, to desire other things more than we desire growth. So here's the first thing that we should desire more than growth. We should desire health more than growth. I wonder if you noticed, as Anna read uh, that passage, that actually this concept of bearing fruit, many of you will know that sort of key to our vision as a church, we long to see every life bearing fruit for Jesus, that, that this idea of bearing fruit and growing, it actually is spoken about twice in these few verses at the start of Colossians. Now the first time we've already looked at, verse six, Paul's saying the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. So that idea that the number of Christians growing numerically, the church getting bigger, we've looked at that. But then... Look at what Paul says in verse nine. Look at verse nine. He says this. He says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit, that's exactly the same word as in verse six, bearing fruit in every good work, growing, again, exactly the same word as in verse six, growing in the knowledge of God. So can you see there the difference between what's going on in verse six and what's going on in verse nine? In verse six, this growth, this bearing fruit is all about growth in numbers of Christians. But in verse nine, the bearing fruit and growing is about growth in the spiritual health of each individual Christian, of you and me. In verse six, it was quantitative growth, more Christians. In verse nine, it is qualitative growth, each Christian growing in spiritual maturity. You see, in terms of us as a church, actually the key for us is not actually church growth, but church health. If each of us, if we are genuinely spiritually healthy, if we as individuals, if we are bearing fruit in every good work, if we're growing in the knowledge of God, if we are healthy, then we won't have to sort of struggle and strain for HTC to grow in numbers. It just will, because a healthy plant grows, a healthy child grows, and a healthy church grows grows. We should desire church health. And if you like, my, um, one of my jobs that I see that is one of my roles as rector at HTC is really, if you like, to discover and to remove growth-restricting barriers in our church life. To remove those growth-restricting barriers so that we can be healthy, so that normal, natural, healthy growth can occur in this church. And let me just quickly give you two two very different examples of potential current growth-restricting barriers in the life of our church. First barrier is this, us not speaking about Jesus in our day-to-day lives. Now, I've talked in previous weeks in this series uh, about this sort of sense in society of our worlds getting smaller because of the pandemic, us being curved in on ourselves, us, you know, for many, not rubbing shoulders with work colleagues anymore because we've been working from home. And that's why I particularly want to encourage every single one of us here to think through as we reboot, as we, as it were, come out of this pandemic, how do we make sure that we don't stay in this little little sort of tiny weeny bubble as we reboot, not really deeply interacting with anyone who's not yet a Christian. That was the first sort of potential growth-restricting barrier. Here's a very different type of growth-restricting barrier in the life of our church. This building. This building. You know, before the pandemic, our, our building wasn't able to support our current ministry, let alone any future growth. The pews uh, meant this space was far, far too inflexible. Uh, not enough other rooms out there may, means the children's groups are a huge challenge. Now, I do not want to be focusing on Revitalized 250, our building project, the whole time. It itself is not our vision. 
It is supporting our vision. But that is why it is so critical. Because currently, this building itself is a major growth-restricting barrier in the life of our church. You know, we long that God would continue to grow his kingdom through the ministry of HTC. And healthy growth is much more likely to take place with a significantly modified building. And so what I'd love to just to mention now is just I'd love to give you a heads up that all of you who are on our database, uh, this coming week, uh, you'll be getting a letter in the post just giving you all the details, a letter from me and Susanna. And really the key thing for the moment is to ensure that lots of the HTC church family, us, have given something to the project. Uh, Those external to HTC, they are more likely to give to the project if they know that most, most of the church family have already chosen to give to Revitalize 250. Currently, around 100 or so individuals and families have given specifically to Revitalize 250. Some of you will be here. A huge, huge thank you to you. And if you haven't yet given specifically to to Revitalize 250, in addition to your your regular giving to HTC, I would say just we, we would love to encourage you to think about and pray about whether you might be able to give to Revitalize 250 specifically in the next month. And in the letter that you're going to be sent, uh, I've set out a very sort of simple diagram which gives an idea of one way that 4.8 million, which is the total amount, we've got about uh, just over a quarter of the way there so far, but one way that 4.8 million pounds could be raised amongst 450 givers, which is what HDC currently is. Now that ranges from one uh, very significant gift of 1 million pounds at the top of the pyramid, uh, though if there's more than one of you wanting to give 1 million pounds, we won't say no, um, uh, to uh, at the bottom, 100 people uh, giving 250 pounds over the course of a four-year period, so that works out as about five pounds per month. So really the message is, if you haven't yet chosen to give to Revitalize 250, we would be so, so grateful. If you might pray, you might consider, as it were, what level on that pyramid you might be able to give at for Revitalize 250, and then set up your giving by the end of June uh, by heading to the HTC website, and that is all part of helping to remove this growth-restricting nature of this building. So two examples I've given there, very different examples, two examples of growth-restricting barriers, this building and our reluctance to speak about Jesus. But both of them, actually, they go under the heading of we must desire spiritual health more than just merely growth in numbers. So to deliver growth, we need to desire health more than growth. And then the second thing we need to desire more than growth, we need to desire God more than growth. See, there are two dangers with thinking about growth. One is to abdicate all responsibility for church growth. And as a church, do sort of, you know, no planning, no strategizing about the different ministries of our church. But there is an opposite danger. And that opposite danger is actually far more deadly. And that is to assume all the responsibility for church growth. When the reality is all our plans, all our procedures, all our programs, they are worthless without God's anointing. Uh, In our um, HTC staff team meeting, which we have on Wednesdays, uh, just last Wednesday, uh, one of the team, uh, she had been the previous night to the opening night at the Clapham Grand. The first time the Clapham Grand had opened after uh, the pandemic, and it was a big comedy night. And she'd gone there, and there were four comedians on the bill. And uh, each of those four comedians, in their routine, each of the four mocked Jesus and the Christian faith. And she said to us, this, uh, this staff person, she said, you know, with tears in her eyes as she was saying it, she, she said, it really just made her realize how countercultural it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ today. How the need for Jesus, it is so great around us. And you see, with that great need, with so many people so far away from a relationship with Jesus Christ, us just sort of focusing on the latest church growth strategy, that's not going to cut it, is it? No, we need to focus more on God. You know, it's one reason why we've just had over this weekend the upper Zoom, uh, uh, 24 hours of people praying. Many of you will have been on, on Zoom over the last 24 hours praying and praying specifically for more people to come to know Jesus. And here, it's why Paul prays. Verse 11, he prays for the Colossians to be strengthened with all power 
according to God's glorious might. Just take those words in. He prays for them to be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. Strengthened with all power. Now today, it is Pentecost Sunday. And do you remember what happened on that very first Pentecost? Jesus had said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, he'd said, stay in the city, stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. They had to stay where they were until they had received the power of the Spirit. So they were not going to grow the church on the basis of their sort of their life experiences. They were not going to grow the church on the basis that they'd spent three years with Jesus. They were not going to grow the church on the basis of their intellectual arguments for the existence of God. They were not going to grow the church on the basis of a well thought through and well reasoned through church growth strategy. They weren't going to grow the church on the basis of their good natured charm. All of those things, they may be fine things, but none of them were actually going to grow the church. Now, the power to transform people's lives, the power to grow the church, that power comes from on high, from God. Jesus told them to wait for that power, to wait for the anointing, to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them, to desire God more than growth. And then once they had that power, the power of God, then they'd be ready to go and proclaim Jesus to those who so greatly needed him. Now, the wonderful news for us post that first Pentecost is that that moment when you or I, when we came to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, that moment, he came to live in us. So we don't need to sort of sit around and wait for the Holy Spirit because he is already living in us if we're trusting in Jesus. But we are instructed, as it says in Ephesians, we're instructed to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that sense of God by his Spirit anointing us again and again. That sense of God by his Spirit empowering us again and again. That that sense of God giving us these tasks and empowering us to do them. You might say that sense of the Holy Spirit rebuilding us for the task of proclaiming Jesus to those who so greatly need him. I, I don't know about you, but I desire gospel growth. I desire gospel growth. I long that we see a rebuilding of God's church across South London. But that has got to include a longing to see a rebuilding of ourselves. We need to keep saying, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh for proclaiming the gospel to those around me. As Paul says in verse 9, God, fill me with the knowledge of your will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives There's a little chorus, I think it was written about 100 years ago, but it's the prayer I'd love each one of us to pray today on this Pentecost Sunday. And it goes like this. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on me.